What's up, everybody? This is Sean from Morning Lifter. I appreciate the time for you coming in today. I've got another great guest with me, the owner of the Top Strength Project, Steve Tripp. This uh, individual, I mean, geez, Steve, I've been watching you for a while. Um, it was actually through uh, Stan Efferding's, I think it was the 50 states in 50 days or 50 states in 60 days, something like that. And I caught wind of your, your gym, actually. And I was like, holy shit. Like, not only is this place just incredible in terms of the things that you have, but you yourself are just, I see the term gorilla being thrown around with you a lot. And that seems to be the, uh, that seems to be a very, very accurate description. And oh, it's very, very flattering. Yeah. It's yeah. Funny how <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, especially, uh, and I had reached out to you at one point and I was asking like how, uh, yeah, exactly. I was asking how tall you are because you, from the, from the, photos and the videos you seem to have a lot of ground to cover especially when you're squatting and, and you squat quite a bit of weight um and you had said you were six five and so i'm six four and so to see somebody of that height squat that kind of weight at that depth i was incredibly impressed with and i can't squat anywhere near that but i just thought it was oh, nice to see time, give it time give it time Go yeah <laughs> well hopefully uh but it, not only not only was it was it you, but it was everything about your gym. And so I was really intrigued uh, on both the strength side of, of what you do, but also on the business side of what you do, because I was looking at your page and correct me if I'm wrong, but it was in 2016 you started this. Is that correct? I started I started the top training project. Yes, yes. My yeah. Gym. We're the second yeah. Location. So we've, we've been here for two years this month. And I had a previous location for, for three years, a smaller location. Um, and that was like a, like 3000 square feet, more of a, more of a training studio with, you know, 20 or 30 members because I had the strongman equipment and the powerlifting specific equipment that no one else really had. So we had, you know, a small group of members who paid a membership and used the facility, but it was really just a personal training studio. And after being there for about three, really two and a half years, um, you know, we started doing some group X and we just started growing and I just kind of wanted some more equipment. Um, so I said, you know, maybe, maybe we can, maybe we can move into a bigger space, something in the six, seven, eight, nine, maybe 10,000 square foot area, and maybe offer a general membership if there, if there, if there's a, if there's a market for it. However, there was a bit of, I, I was a little anxious to do that. I was a little apprehensive to do that because in the last place, as you can imagine, we had a a very specific community and culture that was organically cultivated. You know, right. it was myself, four other trainers, our clients. And like I said, the members were comprised of people who specifically seeked out, you know, the specialty powerlifting bars, the, the things to do accommodating resistance, being able to deadlift with chalk. And of course the strongman implements because I had a full, full set of a strongman. So it was us, our clients and mostly competitive athletes are strength enthusiasts. So you can imagine what type of um, environment that created. So when I found a space and started thinking about what the business model looked like of having a general membership, I said, how quickly is, is what we have, what I really value going to be watered down? You know, how long till it becomes like a gold? You know, it would never quite be like a planet or LA Fitness, I didn't think, but at least what we have will be watered down. And that really concerned me a lot because it's nice to have the best equipment, but you can't replace the community and the culture that went along with what we had going on. So, um, you know, that was my, 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 my one reservation, but I can tell you, I found a wonderful space, a great landlord who was really excited what we wanted to do. I have a background in construction, so I was really able to lay everything out exactly how I wanted and um, having you know, 300 to 400 members where we're at now has really only added to that culture that was originally cultivated in the first place. So it's been great um, to, to, my, uh, to my surprise and to my satisfaction. So I'm very, very fortunate. And, and um, you know, you're not the first person to say that. People who see it, um, never mind everybody that comes here, people who see the gym from Instagram or our website, um, it, it holds true to that kind of image that you see. 
Um, you know, every Monday I have 13 squat racks and every Monday there's 400 fucking pounds in every single one of them. You know, some people are benching on international chest day, but Mondays here, everybody's in the squat racks, man. It's really, really great. And I've traveled a little bit. You know, I went to um, high performance. I went to um, Bradley Martin's gym, uh, zoo culture. I went to the, the, the LA goals, you know, um, great gyms great places to train but i gotta be honest i couldn't wait to come home and train here with with my boys and the girls i call them the top strength brigade and um i'm very very grateful and fortunate to be a part of this of this place and i mean that i really mean that a lot yeah it, it there's there's no shortage of really strong individuals at least from what i've seen on on your page and and the uh the shared stories and things like that. And so you can definitely tell like that, that community and the, uh, I mean, it just, it, it gives off a blue collar vibe, you know, it just, and that's what I love about like you, your gym seems to have a very old school, uh, just mentality behind it where, Basics. you know, you know, yeah, it's, it's As just you know, the stuff that works, right? Yeah, absolutely. Basics. No frills, no products, no, no herbal life, no MLM bullshit, barbells, free weights, and my favorite machines. You know, I love a nice plate loaded press, a plate loaded row, a belt squat, a nice smooth leg press, a reverse hyper, you know, the, the basics. And I hate, I hate, you know, I, I understand it, it is old school, but I'm noticing, and I hope that the trend, the old school is going to become the new school. People are starting to fucking figure it out, finally, that it's the barbell stuff that works. That's the foundation of fitness. You can try and sell a Peloton bike or some cute new way of doing things, and that's all it is. It's just some new fluff. This is the stuff that works for everybody, men, women, old, young, loading your anatomy with a barbell or a free weight is the base. That's the foundation. You have to have a solid foundation of compound lifting and everything else is great, but that's just the icing on the cake. The meat and potatoes is, is the barbell lifting, the old school stuff. And I don't know if you share this perspective, but that's, that's where I think this industry is going. It's going back there. there there's a market for this kind of, kind of rough around the edges uh, training. And, and, and I'm, I'm really excited to, to see it continue to grow a bit and i think um over the next decade the the, the old school will become more current the new the yeah. old school will become new school you know but well i mean it's not surprising because it's, it's it's just like anything else you know there's there's an ebb and a flow and a wave of things like what was it back in the 80s uh in late 70s it was all machines were the were the height of the industry and 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 that slowly went away and now you're seeing another new cycle come through, but it's, it's not just the same old stuff. It's there's new ways to use the same old equipment uh, as well, but also doing it in a, I think a healthier and a safer way, but I totally agree with you. Yeah. I mean, it's, those are the things like, those are the foundational pieces. You know, if you're going to do anything well, you need to know how to squat. You need to know how to bench. You need to know how to deadlift. You need to know how to do those things. Uh, you know, the, the old term of, pick things up and put them down multiple times. So those are, those are great foundational pieces. So I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, from your webpage and, and I know, I, I believe you shared it a handful of times on your own uh, social media, but some of the transformations, but specifically your own um, has been really, really remarkable. Um, I think it was from like about four or five years ago up until now, you know, what were some of the things that you did to put yourself in the position that you're at now? Uh, like physically? Yeah. So um, that's a great question. And I appreciate you saying that. Um, so I've been doing this since I was 13. So we're coming up on, on 20 years. Um, and you're not the first person that has noticed and commented on the fact that I have made, you know, the, the progress has been consistent over those 20 years, I would say, you know, every year, a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, a little bit leaner. But over the last five to six years or so, um, there has been, you know, my, my progress has, has been more, um, there's just been more of it in the last five to six years. And 
Um, what I would specifically attribute that to is, is five main things. So um, I started lifting weights because when I hit puberty, I, I, my, my hormones started changing and I, and I became very estrogenic. Um, started holding a lot of water. Um, I had kind of the kind of the gyno, the bitch fit thing going on. And to be completely honest with you, at a pool party when I was 13, this girl named Megan Copeland was a, was a girl I dated back in the sixth grade or seventh grade. And we were kind of going back and forth and she called me titty boy at the pool party. And I wasn't upset or offended. I was kind of like, I kind of was like, yeah, I, I always knew that I never liked the way that I looked or the way that I felt, but I was young. I didn't really know how it's supposed to be, you know? So when she said that I was very eye opening and I started lifting weights and what kept me in the gym, you know, every day for two to three hours a day for the first 10 to 12 years was just, I liked the way that I felt when I was lifting weights and I hated the way that I felt when I wasn't. Mm. And it's just as simple as that, you know, just when you, when I'm, when I'm pumped up and the water would pull from the fat tissue and go into the muscle tissue, I would feel good. I would feel swollen. I would feel tight. And I really loved the way that felt. Um, and, and, and then, you know, when, when the pump went away and I was going about my day of life, I just kind of felt like block, you know, I wanted to get back into the gym. Um, so fast forward, um, I got in a, a pretty serious car accident uh, the day before my 17th birthday, fell asleep at the wheel, got into a head-on collision, and uh, shattered my jaw, broke both arms, broke both legs, lost like over 110 pounds. I was a train wreck. Um, and then um, I decided to go to college, and I went to Bridgewater State, studied physiology, got back in shape, played football there, and started learning about exercise a little bit more intently, which really was the best thing that could have happened to me. Um, athletically and physically because I really started to understand movement a bit more and and, um, and and how to pull from the floor and how to squat correctly, you know, getting that ass on my calves and stuff like that. And just kind of training with less ego and a little more, a little more knowledge. And then um, I got into the industry. I started, I started being a personal trainer and, um, you know, just always trained intuitively, always, you know, wanted to be strong, but also wanted to be big. So kind of did a, kind of did like a, uh, you know, an, an accidental Michael Hearn strength hypertrophy, you know, uh, strategy. And it was about six years ago when I was like, shit, man, I haven't like maxed out in a while, you know? I wonder what I can lift. So I had a 500 squat for the first time, um, a 600 dead, and I could bench 400 plus for like years. I never really got much higher than 450, but... So I kind of thought about that and I was like, you know, those are some decent lifts for a 230 pound guy, you know, 240 pound guy. Uh, maybe I should really start looking into like programming and percentages and RPE and, and how to basically structure blocks of training rather than just coming into the gym and training intuitively. So I started learning about that a bit. And that's the first of the five is the first of the five factors that I really think contributed to my progress specifically over the last six years. I started to learn about linear periodization and how to um, increase load and, and manipulate volume and intensity, and also most importantly, have periods of rest, structured rest, deloads. Um, the second thing is I hired a nutrition coach. I hired this local bodybuilder named Dave Finelli. He wrote in my first diet plan. And I always ate what I thought was healthy, and I always avoided what I thought was shitty, but I never really looked at you know specific macronutrients um, specific micronutrients and, and basically um, nutrient timing and portion size. So he gave me a specific diet and I followed it to a T and I saw great results from it. So really taking a deeper specific look into both programming and setting that up and also my nutrition. So obvious answers there, one and two. The third um, is I stopped, I, I, I stopped drinking so much. I used to be a huge party animal, um, a big time weekend warrior. Um, I live for that shit. I used to love going out, partying. Um, I was really in that scene every weekend, especially when I started making money. You know, obviously in college, that's a huge fact of it. But when I was out of college and living here in Providence, I was very much in the scene. And um, what made me stop, I didn't stop because, you know, of, of health reasons or because I wanted to get bigger and stronger. I stopped because, how old are you? I'm 35. So I'm, I'm 33. Yeah. When I, when I got into my late twenties, my hangovers were friggin' brutal. I used to not have really bad hangovers, but I would get so I would have brutal yeah. toothache hangovers, and I would be working, you know, eight to a hundred hours a week at the gym because I had a big training business at the time. And I'd party my ass off all weekend, and I'd be on the couch all day Sunday eating cereal, hating my life. 
And after like a year and a half of that, I was like, I'm going to chill out with drinking a little bit. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to chill with the booze and that helped with my training immensely because, you know, I always kind of knew in my head that each week I was probably taking five steps forward, four and a half steps back, or maybe six steps back on some weekends. But I justified it in my head because I enjoyed doing it. And, you know, it, it was part of my social life. But when I eliminated it, um, I could really see what an impact it had. Um, and it's definitely correlated to opening my own space because six to eight months later, after I quit going to the bar every weekend, I opened my own gym. So financially, it helped out quite a bit too. You know, being able to get a good weekend to work in rather than suffering on the couch and not blowing a bunch of money out partying, it definitely helped build this gym. So that's the third thing, basically growing up and, 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 stop, and, and quitting with the partying. The fourth is opening my own gym um, is the atmosphere. You know, I had my own place. Not that the other gyms I worked at weren't phenomenal. I worked at Boston Sports Club, it was great. I worked at this place, Synergy, it was great. But once I had my own place, I was surrounded solely by like-minded individuals. Mm. Um, I always tend to be the biggest and strongest in the room. Um, and something I say all the time is the strongest guy in the room is in the wrong room, but so is the smartest guy. And I started becoming aligned and associated with people who were way smarter than me and stronger than me in other areas, definitely relatively, right? I'm a bigger guy, but there were these guys who were small that were putting a very impressive weight, very, very intelligent. This guy, John Amore, who worked in my last place, um, was a huge help to me because he was just brilliant um, in reference to learning about programming and technique and training with intention. And then I started researching a bit more. Basically, being around other like-minded people makes you want to learn. If you're humble enough to put yourself in that position, a lot of a lot of big fish want to stay in small ponds, and that's the that's the antithesis of development. I really started to try and put myself around people that were better, stronger, smarter than I was, and um, you can't fail in an environment like that. So that was massive. That's number four. Is um, is humility and modesty and being able to to take a step back and surround yourself by people who are better than you and grow. And then the fifth and final thing that I think really played a large role in my success over the, or my development over the last five to six years is when I opened my own place, like I said, a lot of the membership was made up of competitive athletes. And I never had any intention of competing at all because I never thought I'd be any good. But um, some people in my gym were competing, wanted to compete. So I said, fuck it, I'll jump in, let's compete. So I did my first pilot to meet and I won. Then we did another one and I won. And then I started doing strong, man. I just kept being successful and winning. And when you have, I've always been a motivated guy. I've always wanted to lift and always wanted to get stronger. But when you have a specific goal, a specific date to peak a specific lift or series of lifts, you're obligated to really stick to your training, have very specific periods of progressive overload and rest, progressive overload and rest, and then peak. And what, what, what better way at the end of a peak, at the end of a competition to really look at what you lack and then, and then address that. So abbreviated and answer the five things is taking a look at my training, learning about training strategies. The second thing is taking my nutrition more seriously. The third is chilling, chilling out with the booze. The fourth is surrounding yourself with like-minded people that are bigger, better, and stronger than you. And the fifth is getting involved in, in, in competition, which I think is probably everybody's answer that's made some gains, right? But um, that, that, that's definitely what has attributed to my success over the last five or six years. I, I think those are great answers. There's one that really stood out to me uh, that I absolutely love was getting around like-minded individuals. And that is something that I am such a huge believer in because, and you hit the nail right on the head. You talked about the humility and the modesty where if, if you are, are not humble enough to recognize the things that you don't know and aren't willing to learn, you're, you're going to be stagnant forever, or you might even take steps backward, you know? Absolutely. And the moment you think you know everything, that's the moment you stop learning. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's where I think it's so important for people to understand is, uh, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson. I'm not sure if you, if you know who he is, but he's a Canadian psychologist and he's got this book called 12 rules for life. And he, he has a chapter in the book that talks a lot about that. And it's, it's called, um, what was it called? It's, um, 
assume the person that you're talking to knows more than you do something along those lines. And, yep. and that's, I mean, that is really what it's all about is when you go into a room, you want to make sure that you aren't the smartest person or you aren't the strongest person, because when all of a sudden everybody's coming to you for answers, then how are you getting any better? You're helping others. Yeah. Which is great. But at the same time, you don't want to be that person uh, who isn't growing, you know? And so then there's always going to be, that's the great thing about life too, right? I mean, there's always somebody out there who's just a little bit bigger, faster, stronger, smarter than we are. And there's always something that we can learn from somebody else. Yeah. And they don't have to be bigger or stronger. I've learned just as much from the people that come to me for coaching as I have for people that I go to for coaching, if that makes sense. Yeah. There's something to be taken away from everybody, especially when you're in a service where you're providing a service for others. You know, yeah. um, I learned that really quickly when I was training at my first job, I sold a bunch of these intro packs called tri packs. I sold like 60 of them because they were on sale one month. And that's how I really started. And I was in front of 10 different people a day. And I would, I would, I was communicating. I was trying to teach a hip lift, a hinge, and a plank. Those are the three things I wanted to run through with these people because I was just getting started. And I would give the same direction on uh, on these movements, the same cues, to the same ten to, 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 to ten different people, and I would get ten different responses. You know, just being able to communicate and articulate to different individuals is 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 perhaps the most challenging piece of being a, a coach or whatever people want to call me. You know, um, everybody receives information differently um and being able to communicate the little that you think you know is, is the most important aspect of being relatable and being successful when you're trying to help people i'm sure you deal with that a lot as an educator you know you're, you're up there singing your song and dance but you have to be able to get through to 10 15 20 different students all at once and that can be very challenging yeah it it definitely makes you uh a little bit more aware of the cues you know of of understanding and comprehension. Like those are the, like the little things you wouldn't maybe, I don't want to say normal people, but you know, somebody who isn't in the main profession that I'm in, you start to pick up on the little cues of comprehension of, of, and you can start to uh, almost anticipate what they will or will not get, you know, and then you can start to, to preface uh, something with saying now, you may not understand this, but here's the route that we're going to go, you know? And, and so eventually the old saying, when I was a football coach, there's a method to the madness, right? You got to trust the system. Um, you know, all of those, those buzzwords, but also understanding too, like you had mentioned, like you can take feedback from those same people, you know, and, and Ooh. there, there's always something that you can learn from. So I, I really, I really like that. Um, you There's mentioned something to get away from everyone and every experience if you're receptive yeah to, to pick up on it yeah, yeah. and and just the just the ability to network with people you know that's one of the things that i've really enjoyed about doing my podcast uh, whether or not anybody watches it i don't know but the fact that i've had the opportunity to speak with a lot of different people and learn a lot of different backgrounds um it's really been uh, an enjoyable experience, especially through the whole COVID thing, finding out, you know, where people have struggled, finding out people's successes, uh, how the weight room has helped, how books have helped, how, you know, they've been able to motivate themselves in ways maybe they had never thought possible, you know? And so for me, those, those have been some really, really fascinating stories. Uh, you had mentioned too, that you said you're always a, a pretty motivated guy. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, cause there's, there's, there's a, uh, I don't know if, it, I don't know if it's a disagreement, but some people will say, you know, motivation doesn't always stick around. I, I, I have a saying that uh, motivation gets you started, but discipline keeps you going similar to the Jocko willing discipline equals freedom deal. Uh, so kind of, can you walk me through, you know, how is it that you're consistently, you know, geeked up or motivated? You know, what are some go-tos for you to keep your own, you know, mental capacity at the highest? Well, I, I, I've spoken about this a good handful of times when I do questions on Instagram. 
Um, you know, I put up questions and people will, will bring that up. You know, how do you stay motivated? How do you stay on? You know, what do you do when you have a setback? And um, the whole motivation, discipline paradigm people always discuss, that's just people's interpretation of words. Mm -hmm. You know, and, 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 and I, I agree with that, that motivation comes and goes. Um, and, but discipline, I suppose, could be defined as or, or understood as like a character trait. You know, he's a disciplined individual, she's a disciplined individual, so that keeps them on. So I definitely agree with it's not about motivation because motivation comes and goes and discipline is more like who you are. Yeah. I think you could also define yourself as a motivated individual. So it's just a, it's just a different way people want to argue what, what certain words mean. So whatever. But um, for me, what's up? Sure. Say hi to Maria. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. So, to me, I think I'm, I'm, I've just become, you know, through my experiences and hardship and challenges and failures, um, I would like, I would like to define myself as somebody that just takes responsibility for himself, mm. take responsibility for my choices, and I take responsibility for what I think it takes to get to where I want to go. Um, and now, I think was there a realization that came to point at some point? You know, was it during the partying scene, or was it early in life? You know, when you had decided, like, well, son of a bitch, like I, I've got to own it and and. Yeah man up to it you know was there a point in time where you kind of hit that or was it gradual if i had to say so so growing up um i was very average athletically you know, i played a bunch of sports and i was very average and i just kind of like accepted the fact that i was just not that good at some stuff and i hung out with a lot of the jocks and a lot of the kids that were the best at the sport and the things that we did i also rode a lot of bmx I had a great interest in motocross and i would ride and i was like okay but I hung out with kids that were awesome. And I just kind of like accepted that I wasn't that good and they were great. And that's just the way that it was. And it wasn't until um, after being in the gym for 10 to 12 years, when I started being the biggest, strongest guy in the gym, not because I were necessarily had sought out to be, but it, I just happened to be. And that was just a result of me working at it. Yeah. Consistently every friggin' day two to three hours a day day after day around the clock and i and i did it the first 10 to 15 years like i said solely because i just like the way that i felt when i did it then when i graduated school and i started being a personal trainer i became the master trainer at the gym i was at within two to three months and i i was very fortunate to find success very quickly in in that industry you know i was doing 140 to 160 sessions a month very, very quickly, which was the highest in the gym. And I kind of had this realization, like, wait a minute, I'm the, I'm, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the best, I'm the best trainer at this gym, which isn't necessarily true, but I was doing, I was bringing in the most money. I was the most successful. I was the strongest. And I was like, how, how did that happen? And I just kind of thought about it. And I was like, cause I've worked at it. I've worked at it subconsciously. I never had the goal of being this guy, but I just stuck with it and now I am. And then I started realizing, you know what, you know what, dude, you can be, you can be it. You just got to, you just got to work. You know, it's not, it can be something you're born with or something you're born without, but everybody has the potential. Us as human, us as a species, we have the potential to improve just a little bit. Now we're not all starting at the same spot, right? But we can all improve a little bit. And consistent, small, incremental improvement over days, weeks, months, years can really become something spectacular. You know, that's why we're flying airplanes and talking on cell phones and apes are still climbing in trees. You know, we can, we can grow, we can adapt, we can learn. So for me, when it comes to discipline, motivation, consistency, whatever, I just want to get stronger. I want to be bigger. I want to be leaner. I want to be successful. And I am not scared or intimidated by looking at myself and doing what I think is the appropriate way to get there. Um, and also, I think what creates that mindset and that perspective is, you know, and this probably isn't the best thing, but it's effective, is the tremendous distaste I have for laziness, for excuses, for whining. It literally makes my teeth hurt when I hear people 
complain and whine and say they can't or decide that they can't. Um, complaining, it just, it gives me a really sour feeling because it's like, you got one shot, man. Yeah. Like, like enough, enough. Mm-hmm. And I know what it's like to be a peon looking at a stud. You know, I know what that's like. And it's a choice whether you want to be discouraged by that or realize that it's attainable. Like, we're all the same. Like, I, I don't know if you share this idea, but we're all the same. I'm the same as you, and we're the same as someone that's just getting started. We're all human beings. We all have the same potential to learn and adapt. We're the same. But what makes some of us different is some of us will actually take the responsibility to look and really assess what we're lacking and then make the changes and the adjustments to, to really focus on that. And then the things that we lacked at one point can one day be our strengths. And that's what makes some of us different. And I hope that I am different. I hope that I continue to do these things that I think are what's right to get to where I want to go. Um, because I don't know, I mean, maybe it's not that I'm necessarily obsessed with it, but I definitely can't stand the opposite. I can't stand excuse oriented people. I can't stand the poor me types. It really bothers me. I can't be around those people. They, um, they rob you of your enthusiasm. They're poison. They, they crush yeah. your spirit. It's yeah. contagious. And we're not impervious to it. I, I can't hear that shit. I don't buy it. I don't buy it for a second because we've all had setbacks. We've all messed up. We've all had things happen to us that we don't agree with. And we may not think we deserve, but you got to realize what that is, you know? And, and, and what it is, is, is it's an opportunity. You got to go back, figure it out and see what you did wrong, you know, and own it. It's always your fault. That's how I feel. It's always my fault. There are certain things that are out of my control, but there's a lot that is. And focusing on what is and doing the best that I can to master that and accept the things that aren't, I think is a very powerful strategy. It's a simple strategy. It gets complicated and challenging sometimes to be able to apply it, but I really believe it's just a choice. It's like, it's just a choice. We have a thousand different choices each day of what direction you want to go in, whether you want to let something get to you and sour you and crush you, or whether you can learn from different things and just keep moving in, in, in what, I, I, what I would consider to be the right direction. Uh, would, you, would you agree with that? I agree with all of it. I mean, 100%. Sure. There's a lot of... Um, so I want to backtrack a little bit because there's some points that I, I really wanted to touch on with you about that. So... Um, like the complaining piece, there's a, a, one of my favorite quotes from a guy named Jim Rohn. Uh, he was a, a, a really famous uh, leadership speaker, and uh, he did a lot of seminars back in the 80s and 90s. And what you were referencing is almost identical to uh, a lecture series that he did called The Diseases of Attitude, which was one of the first that I heard of him that really actually took me down the pathway of leadership and understanding how mental capacity can really make the difference for how you in a way see the world right um and he's got a quote that says if you spend five minutes complaining then you have wasted five and and it's it's such a powerful idea and he 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 goes on to discuss the diseases of attitude where you know if you if you let those things take control of you then uh, it's, it's very comparable to weeds in the garden, you know, like those, those little things are, uh, they're no, nothing more than, uh, than weeds that, that grow in your yard. And if you don't take care of the weeds in your own front yard, then eventually they'll grow all the way up to your front door. You know, I mean, they'll grow them through the cracks on the sidewalk. So they don't care. You know, that's the same way with the negative thoughts and the negative attitudes. They will find any little way to get in and, and, and sour your day, sour your mind, sour your thoughts, you know? And so he, he has another great quote that says, uh, stand guard at the door of your mind. And that's just all of that is exactly what you're discussing and talking about and, and keeping, uh, you know, it, cause it sounds, especially from you, you have a very solid, solid door around your own, uh, mental capacity, I guess. And, and it is, it's, it's really, really powerful. Um, 
what do you but think? It's not a struggle, though. You know, like it's like there are a lot of challenges. Oh yeah. Oh know, yeah. But, but, you know, some, sometimes but you, you have to, you have to, you have to go back and look at that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, it's 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 uh it's it's interesting. There's, there's a lot of pieces to it. Well, and, and it doesn't mean that you can't have a bad day either. You know, it's not like you have to put on, um, you know, like uh, there's there's uh, one of the pictures I see circulate on social media sometimes. It's is there was the picture of Robin Williams and it was like this this is what depression looks like and it was a picture of him like smiling and laughing. You know, and and so sometimes, um, but but when you can recognize it and and take the responsibility. I mean, that's what it always comes back to, you know, Jordan Peterson, he talks a lot about that as well as, is, is because for you, I mean, there's, it's obvious as to your success is because you, you, you mentioned it, you've taken that responsibility to say like, it's on me. So the only person who's going to make it succeed is myself. Like no one else is going to do it for me. And so if we can get more, if we can get more of that and less of the, well, how can someone else, make me successful and I'm just going to sit on the couch. Well then shit, it's not going to work, you know? And, and like you had said, when you had stopped partying and you started recognizing the, you started to understand and see the things that the changes that you needed to make, like that was the most important thing. And then all of a sudden, a short time later, you've got your own gym, you know, like what has, what has being a business owner, what has owning a gym or just, getting yourself away from like and it being an employee to being an employer you know how has that shifted your own mindset and how has it shifted your training as well i think what, what's nice is, is if you are a motivated disciplined individual when you have your own thing going on you get back what you put in and that can be said for any career but a lot of times when you're working for somebody else you have a certain amount of um requirements, duties, things you're supposed to do that you receive pay for. And if you go above and beyond, you might get a thank you, you might get a bonus. But when you have your own space, your own thing, you can put in as much as you want. There's always something to do. The work never stops. And that's been great. And I also, um, I have my, my business partner, Vanessa, who was really, who inspired me to go on my own and do my own thing. She's the reason why I did it. Um, she shares, if not exceed my own work ethic um she's always been there and i can always rely on her and always count on her and that also helps keep me honest keep me motivated because i some days if i'm down and i don't really feel like it i know she's still on so that gets me back that gets me here because um i, I can depend on her so i feel obligated to be somebody that she can depend on as well um and that goes for and, and that transcends down the line to my other employees and my members as well you know there's any bit of work or, or example that I set forth is going to trickle downhill, you know, and, and that's, that's not an obligation, that's not an obligation that that's that that that's fuel, you know, because I really want to be appreciated. I really want to lead by example. I want that and I, and I owe it to them. Because I believe a lot of my members, a lot of my clients and a lot of my employees are also doing their part. So I owe it to them to do mine. And um, when you're fortunate enough to work for yourself and do your own thing, um, I think that um, kind of that kind of situation is, is more present than if you're someone for working for somebody else. Um, and also, I learned really quickly. So, if I backtracked when I was working at Boston Sports Club, and like I said, I became the master trainer. They used to print out these sheets. Um, there were 2,200 trainers in the entire company at the time, and they would post the top 100 grossing trainers. So when I started to make that list to be top 20, top 15, I started looking at um, session counts and revenue, and I started thinking about that. I started, you know, oh, I got I got 145. I got to get 150 this month, or you know, I got to make sure I'm, I'm I'm getting people in, getting people out. And I started chasing numbers. I started chasing data and chasing numbers and chasing sales and trying to just get as many sessions as possible. And um, for about a month or two of doing that, I started noticing I started losing business. I wasn't doing as well because I was focusing on the number and I wasn't focusing on the service. Um, and it affected, my, it, it affected me financially. So that was a huge lesson for me when, when I actually focused more upon my service and focused more upon being a good trainer, being a good worker and really taking pride in my service. 
that's what brought the revenue. That's what brought the money. And the same thing holds true here. When you have your own place, if you really focus upon doing the right thing and providing the best service and doing what it takes to create the best atmosphere and, um, and lead by example, um, I know how much my members appreciate when I train, you know, because they are here with me. They're training with me. We're loading each other's plates. And they've approached me after and say, it's so cool to train in a gym where the owner is over there squatting 700 pounds. It's so cool when, when, when the owner of the gym is, is, is training the hardest, you know, it makes other people, it makes other people want to do the same and follow suit, focusing on that. And with that, the success comes, the success comes focusing on your practice and focusing on your service and your product, rather than how much money it's making. I believe that will yield the most success, at least in this industry. I'm sure it carries over to others as well, but um, it, it, it motivates me. The, that, that camaraderie, that that community, that 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 keeps me honest. It keeps me on, and um, and it's so funny when it's just a funny situation when people are approaching me and saying how grateful they are for the things that I do and all that. But it's just so it's just such an interesting feeling to be on the receiving end of that because I. It doesn't feel right because I feel like I should be beside them because I genuinely share that same level of appreciation and gratitude for the people I'm fortunate enough to share this with, you know, like, yes, it's my gym, but it's, it's, it doesn't feel that way. It feels like it's ours, you know? And I think that is what kind of has created it. And, and that, that's, what's so nice about having your own thing um, rather than working for somebody else. It, it just feeds into all the things we just spoke about, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's there's no doubt that you possess a great deal of influence, and the I, I, I mean, it's just it's raw leadership capabilities. I mean, that's that's evident, you know, with the amount of people that are willing to come and and see you, and and that leading by example piece, you know, where you're not just there to pinch a profit and go home, you know, you're there and you're actually putting in the same amount of work that other people are paying you, you know, to, to reap benefits of as well. And so it's uh, that's a really cool thing to see because you don't, you don't see that very often, you know, uh, where the owner of a gym, I mean, I haven't been to a gym in like, geez, I don't know, five years. So it's, it's yeah. been a while, but uh you know, you, you don't, you don't hear about it at least all that, all that often. Um, well, to the over the gym, somebody with expendable dollars and they say, Hey, I'll open up a facility, 500 K sell 5,000 memberships, sit back and collect the money. And that's yeah. fine. But a friend of mine that I lived with years back when I was working at Boston sports club and we worked together there. He's a great trainer. A friend of mine, Forrest Kalaski, great guy. Uh, and he ended up opening his own studio and going off on his own and does very, very well. And I ended up going off on my own. And when he came here, um, I was actually writing the mission statement, the mission statement for our website. I don't know what the hell to say. And he brought up a very good point. He said, you have to say what separates, because we're just doing our thing. Yeah. You know, like Vanessa and I, and I think that's really what makes this what it is, is this has just been an organic process. It's very real. We don't have meetings with our staff and say, hey, I want you to act like this because the atmosphere is very important. You know, lead by example, make sure you're here working out, cheer each other on. None of that's happened. It's just, it's just real. It's an organic thing that's, that's come to fruition over time. And he made such a great point that really kind of helped me understand. He goes, you need to say that this is a gym owned by athletes. This is a gym owned by people that live with, because Vanessa and I both compete at some capacity. So we are just as much if not more concerned with our own physical progress and our own clients and members' physical progress as we are with the gym's financial progress. It, it, it comes first. You know, we believe that one leads to the other. And I thought that was such a great point because the last gym that I worked at was owned by a guy with some expendable cash. He was ferociously overweight and unhealthy, and he just kind of showed up, got irritated all the time, and left. But I'm here. Vanessa's here. I got a hammock in the back. You know what I mean? Like, oh, this is my spot. This is what I'm doing. And it's not because I want to be successful as much as I just, I like to lift weights. This is what I like to do. And that is definitely something that is noticed and appreciated by my staff and my members, along with Vanessa as well. And my whole staff, my whole staff, it's a, they're a bunch of studs. 
a bunch of studs. Yeah. Competitive strong women, competitive bodybuilders, people that people that, you know, if they weren't working in a gym, they'd be going to their nine to five and they'd be spending three hours here like everybody else. It's just yeah. and, and it creates such a special, um, true organic thing, you know? Yeah, it, I I it's evident. I mean, you can I, I looking from the outside, I mean you can definitely hear you can definitely hear it, you know, um, as uh, I think we've got about 10 minutes or so, but there's a couple, couple more questions I wanted to ask you because I could definitely go, go on for another hour or so. Yeah, I, apologize. I ramble. I apologize. I ramble. No, it's good. It's good. It's really good. Um, and uh, so let me ask you this. What's the gym taught you? This gym or just training in general? Let's wait. Just, I want to put it on my social media. Oh, Okay. I'll be tagging you anyways, too. So um, just just the like, I guess you could say what has training, what is working out? So what has the process? What have you learned about yourself? Um, this fortunately and unfortunately goes back to, I think, the things we've already talked about. For one, um, what failure is, that failure is is not only okay, but it's a tremendous opportunity. Yeah. For growth. So failure in the gym is obviously very finite, very specific, very technical. Why did I fail that repetition? You can look at it. You can discern it. You can figure it out. You can look. This is what I need to focus on to be successful. And that tactic can apply to other failures in life, in business, in relationships, right? You know? Like, like, what, like what did I do? You know, this failed. How did I attribute to that? And what changes can I make to learn from this situation? So failing often enough in here is going to translate to being able to manage and handle failure outside of the gym. Yeah. Um, something that I think is so special about this hobby, this practice of training and nutrition and all that is we are in control of every single variable aside from our genetics right? But you're in control of everything. It's direct return. And you can't say that for many other things in life. You can't say that for relationships. You can't say that for business. You can't say that for parenting, right? You can really give your all in any of those aspects, really give everything you can do what you think is right. Give the most effort, really give yourself to something and it can blow up in your face because there are many pieces of those puzzles that are completely out of your control, especially when you're dealing with other people, when you're dealing with business, when you're dealing with children, you know, you, you can have an impact, but they're going to do what they want to do. And that's it. The thing with training that's so special is if you get your ass here and you train with intent and you do a good job and you focus, if you hit your meals, if you get your rest, if you assess, you're going to make progress, period. And if you don't, you're going to make less progress. And that's okay, but it's direct return. And I think that's such a special thing because when I'm on, when I'm doing my part and I'm making consistent progress and I'm eating and I'm training and I'm resting, that really fuels me. And it makes me feel like I have the tools and basically I'm equipped to handle the other challenges that may come my way outside in life. And it sounds corny, but it's so true to me. Because when I don't rest or if I don't train well and if I miss meals, my training goes to shit and I just feel like garbage and I don't feel as equipped as I do when I'm on to handle the other stressors in life. So, um, you know, training, what it's taught me is basically that it, it's a device, it's a mechanism that I can use because I'm in control of all the variables to make myself feel good, to make myself feel like I'm doing the right thing. And it helps me in all other aspects and avenues of, of my life, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I always, the one thing that I always liked about it was, uh, especially for me, because I train, you know, I'm up at about four o'clock in the morning because that's the best time for me to train. But by the time I'm done, it's it's a sense of accomplishment. Like that's something that that, you know, that I did that no one else told me that I had to do, but I decided to get up and to go work out. And then by the time I'm done, I've done more than most of the general population does has done at that point in time already, you know, and um, one of my good friends, it was a really cool compliment. Uh, 
it, he was uh, he's my uh, a former college roommate and we were we were chatting and, and I was talking to him about some of the things that I've been doing and he's like I don't know how you do it all you know he's just like you're just it, it's almost robotic you know but it's like that's I've gotten to a point where if I don't do it like I feel like shit you know it's, yeah, it's it was, uh, my, my comment was going to be when he said that you're probably like I don't know how you don't bro yeah I mean it's it is it's it's incredible I, it. I need this yeah exactly it's it's one of those things where um uh jordan peterson says too oh, it's another quote that i love oh, you're like the fifth person to bring him up i, I gotta i gotta i gotta stop putting it off and start listening to some it, of this shit, I'm, I'm, i'll i'll send you some links when we're done um his yeah. stuff his stuff has changed i guess you could say it's changed my life it's changed my thought process it's changed the way i view life it's changed the way i view people it's changed the way i view everything um and it, it took a while. I had to listen to some of his, his stuff can go super deep and can go super dark real quick. And so it took me a couple of months of actually listening to some of the same speeches over and over before I finally started to figure it out because he is probably one of, I think he's one of the smartest hundred people to come around in the last 100 years. I mean, I think he's, I think he's that important. That's um, great. But I would I would check his book out. It's called Twelve Rules for Life too. But um, he he said one of the things that I thought was so cool. Uh, he says when when you're when you're living life to its fullest, you it was something to this to the effect of when you're living life to its fullest, you don't realize you're alive. Like because you're so in the moment. Yeah. That's where like time passes by so fast. You know, like you don't even recognize what's going on. Um, that was one. And then another one was, he said, you should burden yourself with so much responsibility, uh, that you can barely stand because then that will make you so much stronger down the road. And, and like, so that's, that's actually what I'm trying to do. You know, that's what it sounds very much like what you, you are doing as well. You know, you're bearing so much responsibility that you have no other choice, but to lift it up otherwise it's going to completely crush you right and it's always the people who are constantly complaining how busy they are and they ain't even doing a bunch of shit yeah people, the people who are actually really busy you never hear them say a goddamn word about it like, <laughs> i know but you know? It, i love it it's, it's the people who come up to you and tell you man i'm so busy i got so much to do well then, why are you telling me? Like, go, go and do it. You, you just suck at getting stuff done, dude. Period. Yeah, yeah. So it, it. I learned that through being a trainer. You know, the, who who affords training? People who have expendable dollars. Very successful people. And I've dealt with these individuals who have three kids, four income properties. They run the surgery, the the cardiac surgery um, unit up in Brigham and Women's. They commute to Boston four times a week. They have so much on their plate, and they're never late for a goddamn session. Right. Never a minute late. Right. It's always the people who, you know, work three nights a week at a restaurant bartending who are always just so strung out. That's their only responsibility, working three nights a week, and they're just so fucking busy. There's so much to do. It's like, you just you just can't get out of your own way. Yeah. You've got to, yeah. yeah. you gotta take yeah. responsibility, right? It's always those people that are complaining about other people. They always complain about the weather. They're obsessed with politics. All these things that are completely out of their control. They're always stressed out. They're always so busy, but they ain't even ever getting anything done. No, no, that's exactly it. You know? Yeah, that's that's incredible. Yeah, uh, I got two more questions for you. Uh, <laughs> we're we're definitely gonna have to do another another episode of this because this was really good. Um, I always end my my podcast with two questions. Uh, so because my motto through my morning lifter site is all about strength and leadership. So give me your best either definition or phrase of what you think strength is all about. Well, you can't fake strength. Strength is, you know, some people kind of look amazing, but they're, but they're not strong. Um, and there's obviously physical strength and psychological strength as well. Yeah. And you can't have one without the other. Mm. Um, the Top Strength Project name wasn't by accident. It was, it was on purpose. Top is an acronym for train on purpose. Mm. And strength, I believe, is the foundation of fitness. I don't care if you're 600 pounds overweight 
or 110 pounds, or you've been doing this for a long time, the first step alongside getting your body healthy with nutrients and micronutrients is creating a baseline of strength. That's the first piece, regardless of what your goals are. That's the first piece, because having a solid baseline of strength in the compound lifts is gonna make everything else easy. And through that process of building physical strength, you build psychological strength as well through the consistency, the repetition and all that too. And true physiological and psychological strength is an attribute that perpetuates itself into everything else you choose to become involved in, in, in your life. And I really believe that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good answer. That's one of the more unique answers I've had. So that was really good. How about leadership? It's obvious that you are a leader, especially within the, the sector and industry that, that you're in, but what would be your definition of it? It's really, it's really flattering and nice to hear that, that I'm, I'm a leader. Um, and I wonder if I am in fact a good leader, if the fact that I don't intentionally try to lead. If well, I that, think that's why you're successful at it. I, I, I agree. If I am in fact successful, thank you. Know, I appreciate it. At being a leader, I think what contributes to that is that it's not necessarily a goal of mine to lead as much as it is just to do what I think is right and to do what I think it takes to get to where I want to go, taking responsibility like we talked about. Mm -hmm. And if I'm fortunate enough to be around like-minded people that take the time to, to watch and absorb and join that process, um, I don't feel like a leader. I feel like a piece of something bigger. Um, but if people are looking to me for the direction to go, um, that's something I, I really am, am flattered and motivated by and that I really appreciate and um and and, and it, it'll it'll keep me on you know so maybe that's the biggest thing about what what makes me the leader that I am is that it, it's not intentional it's, yeah. it's it's honest it's true I'm not trying to put on a show yeah you know so well, it's a lead it, by, it's a leading by example yeah. I suppose. yeah I think it's evident too one of the things that I love from uh, John Maxwell is he defines leadership as as influence like leadership is influence influence is leadership but i take it a step further and, and i say well if you've got influence then that also means that that you are creating value and so yeah. if you're if you are if you are valuable or you are creating something that is of value then of course people are going to follow you you know if you've got if you've got people who are willing to to you know charge the normandy beaches for you then there's, there's evidence of influence there, you know, even if it's not by your own doing, you know, if it was done, um, uh, not even on purpose, you know, but the, just the way in which the way, in, in, the way in which you are going about it is a hundred percent authentic. And I think that's, that's why it's, you're doing it without even thinking, you know, uh, because of the authenticity and because you're so embedded into it, you know? So that's a really good answer. And, and, uh, that's a hell of a good way to, to end this, uh, end this episode, man. So, um, I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you some links and, I look forward uh, to it. I look forward to it. Thank so you. we'll, we're, we're going to have to do another one of these, uh, when you get through the, some of the Jordan Peters, some of the Jordan Peterson stuff, you let me know because I want to have you back on so we can have a I give me uh, homework. Fair a, enough. Have an intellectual. <laughs> we'll have an intellectual workout, man. I want to hear what your thoughts are on it because for for me, it's been a complete game changer. Just a complete yeah. game changer. So you let me know when you're done. I'll send you some links and uh, that's your homework for for the next time. So you work with a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not graded though. So we'll be okay. <laughs> no, I'm excited. And, you're, you're not the first person to bring him up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, give us some time, man. I, I think it'll help. I think it'll help you grow to another level too. Cause I know it has for me. So uh, Steve, man, this was, this was a, a great interview. I, I greatly appreciate the time, man. And I wish you, uh, yeah. wish you nothing but the best of luck. And, and I'll, I'm, and I'm excited to watch you continue to grow and watch your business grow and see all the success you have, man. If there's anything I can do to help, yeah, fire away. Great. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. I look forward to the next one. Awesome, Steve. All right, man. You have yourself a good one, all right? 
you too. thanks a lot. all right, thank you.